Saving money is good. It allows us to invest for the future and it helps you to become financially independent. I consider myself a super saver, at least compared to the average American. And if you're here watching this video, I assume you're at least interested in learning how to save money if you're not already saving money. With that said, there's a lot of advice out there on how to save money, but not all saving techniques are good. Personally, I have come across some very bad advice. In this video, I discuss some of the good and some of the bad advice that I have gotten on how to be frugal and save more. But first, here's a little bit about me. Hi, welcome to my channel. Thank you for watching. Here's a little bit about me. My household consists of myself, my husband, and my toddler. My mom also lives with us, but she's not included in our finances. We live in a high cost of living city in the Northeast. My husband and I both went to graduate school, but fortunately we no longer have student loan debt. I work in banking and he works in aviation. I take care of the family's finances and I love my role as the self-appointed CFO. I love to talk about all things money, whether it's investing, saving, or making money. I look forward to sharing a wealth building journey with you. I look forward to getting to know you and I hope you enjoyed this video. So I made a list of five very good and five very bad, in my opinion, pieces of advice related to money and savings. Of course, outside of putting the list of bad first, it is in no particular order. I wrote them down as I remembered them. The first bad piece of advice that I recall, I was browsing this blog and it was a family that was on a journey of financial independence. And one of the ways that they listed that they saved money was by not purchasing toilet paper. They use what they called, and I quote, personal washcloths. I cannot tell you how terrible I think this advice is. My first reaction was, oh my goodness, gross. For starters, it was a husband and wife couple and they had kids and I can't help but wonder do you have different color washcloths for everybody so everybody gets their own or are we all mixing and matching here? I understand you're a family, but that might be a little bit too much togetherness for me. And the beauty of toilet paper is that you use it and you forget about it, right? You never have to see it again. The idea of washcloths is that you have to reuse it and you have to wash it. And that's a hard no for me. I want to save money, but I'm not willing to sacrifice personal hygiene for the sake of doing it. Number two, washing disposable plates and utensils. Again, for me, it falls under the gross category. What you should be doing with it is in the name, disposable. Even if you have an environmental concern, it does not seem right to just be reusing and rewashing them. So just go ahead, recycle, and going forward, don't buy any more disposable plate. Personally, I favor normal plates for that reason, because it is a waste of money because you do have to throw it away and buy more, which turns which, out to be more expensive if you had just gone out and purchased dish soap to clean your regular dishes. I do know that on occasion, sometimes we do reuse them because if we have lunch in the middle of the day at home, like we do now because we work from home, we may not have the time to stop and wash a dish in the middle of the day. But if we're using it as a time saver anyway, we're tossing it out. We're not rewashing it and reusing it. I don't know how other people feel about this. It might have to do with the fact that in my house we use those, not compostable ones, but the ones that are made out of recycled paper. So they are a little bit absorbent to some extent and they would be very difficult to rewash. Maybe you have the nicer fancy crystal looking ones that can be rewashed, but for me, again, this is another piece of advice on saving money that I am gonna have to pass on. Number three, using regular gas instead of premium, even if premium is recommended. That piece of advice might work if you have a Honda or if it says suggestion, but depending on the car, premium might be a required type of fuel that you're using. And ignoring that piece of advice can do long-term damage to your vehicle that is more costly than the cost of gas. Whenever a piece of advice is pennywise and pound foolish, I'm not interested in it. If you want to get a regular vehicle 
that takes regular gas, that's fine. But don't advise people with luxury vehicles to buy regular gas in vehicles that need premium gas. Number four, create an LLC to save on taxes. Listen, I get it. In this bull market, everybody's a genius. And as a result, LLC TikTok and LLC Twitter have gotten out of control. They think that the mere act of having an LLC creates a tax shelter. Now, I'm no CPA. I do understand that there are tons of benefits to having an LLC, which is why legitimate businesses tend to have them. But if you don't have a business or you're creating a fake business or the illusion of having one, just for the sake of claiming a new movie projector on your taxes as a business expense, or so you can claim a third of your house as an office, that's a little bit dubious. And I'm being generous here because I think it might fall under the category of fraud. And the IRS is watching. I know these days the IRS is super backed up and it might be tempting to cheat because you're thinking there's no way they're going to catch you. But remember, there's no statute of limitation on this stuff. Whatever they miss today, they can get all caught up on later. Do everything yourself. The key word here being everything. Being handy is a useful skill because not everything is complicated and some emergencies cannot wait for a professional to get to back to you eventually. Some things are just time sensitive, but not everyone can or even should be doing everything themselves. Things like plumbing and electrical, in my opinion, should be left to the professionals. That is another way to avoid very costly and dangerous mistakes down the road, like flooding that can damage personal property or code violations that might lead to an electrical fire. If you are enjoying this video so far, don't forget to hit the like button so the algorithm knows that it's good. And of course, subscribe for more content. If you think any of the information that I provide here might be helpful to somebody else, be sure to share it with them. But of course, not all advice is bad advice. I've received some very good advice as well. And here's my list of five things that I think were very good pieces of advice when it comes to personal finances. The first one is to get the employer match. That one is very good advice because it is free money. It is not money that you would otherwise get if you were not making those contributions to your retirement account. It's not like you can tell your boss, hey, I'm not gonna make a contribution this month, but give me an extra 5% in my paycheck. Not going to happen. However, if you contribute to your account, you get the 5% contribution. In my case, at my current employer, I don't get a match, but my husband gets 100% dollar for dollar up to the first 5% of his contributions. At my old company, I was getting 100% up to the first 6% of my salary. If the employer match was a sponsored clickbait ad, it would say employers hate this one trick with an exclamation point at the end. All bold letters because it is truly the easiest way to double your money. Number two, this is the second piece of very good financial advice that I received. Automate your savings. Employer and sponsored accounts or even your own accounts that you manage Having an automatic saving schedule where money automatically goes into those accounts is the best thing you can do. In fact, if you're doing a percentage rather than the fixed dollar amount, that is an even better approach. You get even more money going into that particular savings vehicle. Also, you can't forget to save. You can't have something happen where you're too busy to make a particular transfer. It just happens whether you remember to do it or not. And since it's automatic, you never see the money and you can't miss what you don't see. So it covers the two most human things that can happen. One, which is to forget. And two, it eliminates the temptation of spending the money rather than saving it. Because if you don't see it, you don't miss it. Third piece of very good financial advice is to budget. You can't manage what you don't track. You can't cut out frivolous expenses if you don't know what you're spending. I know that the word budget has a negative connotation because it is linked to austerity measures and rationing. It evokes the idea of poverty, but you can budget for fun and luxuries. Budget doesn't have to mean tightening your belt. It's about setting clear guidelines that match with your objectives and make sure that you stay on track. For example, in our case, I have a budget for coffee and eating out, even though we make coffee at home most of the time. On occasion, my husband does like to have a specialty coffee, and in my case, I like to have a nice 
chocolate chip cookie from Starbucks. If you haven't had a chocolate chip cookie from Starbucks, I highly recommend it. Make sure they toast it for you. I think they're delicious. Maybe I have bad taste. I don't know, but I love it. But either way, be sure to budget. Also, before the pandemic, we were saving for travel and we would budget a certain amount regularly into a travel sinking fund. Budgeting does not have to equal punishment or deprivation. It's a way for you to help identify waste. Number four, be very careful who you marry. This might sound more like relationship advice, but it is really good money advice. A bad life partner can be costly. They have access to your finances and they can derail the best of plans even if it is unintentional. If that person is undisciplined, they will set you back. I see a lot of people posting in various forums online, seeking help on how to deal with their wasteful and irresponsible partners. I have seen spouses talk about hidden massive credit card debt, unpaid federal taxes, an unwillingness to work, going into debt for a degree in a field that they decide that they didn't like anymore, just all around struggle bus trip on a journey together based on deception and irresponsibility. Personally, I have my own story of dodging a bullet and that is gonna have to be a separate video. Let's just say the things that you think you want aren't always good for you, and they're certainly not always good for your wallet. Out of all the other pieces of advice that mom and dad always gave you about choosing a life partner, I would like to add the following. Find someone who's motivated, motivated to work, motivated to bring in money. Find somebody who's responsible. They're gonna be a good steward of your assets and everything that you bring in, and find somebody who shares your values not just whether or not you wanna have kids, but also your shared values surrounding personal finances and financial objectives. That person is more likely to work with you as a team if they are able to see the vision. This will help avoid marital issues as well as money troubles. And the fifth piece of very good financial advice that I received was to not buy whole life insurance. I was this close to buying it guaranteed returns, which if that's true, after everything I learned about whole life, it's that it's going to be very low returns because they tend to be largely invested in bonds, which I can buy myself without having to pay an exorbitant premium. And finally, he told me that all the rich people use it to build wealth. I don't know where he got that information from, but I have never heard a millionaire or a billionaire say that they have built wealth with this particular product. I had three separate meetings with him months apart. He even told me to reduce my husband's 401k contributions just to the employer match and to use the rest of the money towards the biggest policy that I could afford. He called it anything but whole life, just a, and I quote, great product. At the last meeting, I could not figure out why I had never heard of this product before, especially since it was so amazing. I told him I had to go home and think about yeah. it, but this time I requested some documents to take home with me. And after looking at them without the bias salesman talking in my ear, it clicked. It was whole life insurance. At that point, I emailed them and I told them, I don't want the product because it doesn't make sense for me at this time. I explained in a very detailed fashion why somebody at my income and asset level did not need whole life insurance. And what do you know? I never heard from them again. To me, having life insurance until you're 90 is pointless and it comes at the opportunity cost of lost market returns as the funds are tied up. So there we have it, the five very bad and five very good pieces of financial advice. Let me hear from you in the comment section below. What kind of good and what kind of very bad pieces of advice have you received throughout your life? I would like to continue sharing my thoughts on all things money with you. So I would appreciate it if you could help out the channel by liking this video and sharing it with anyone you think might benefit from it. If you want to see more content, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can know when new videos come out. I'll see you in the next one.